justify prove to be right or reasonable justification is at the heart of all legal and political argument but at a time when argument itself is slave to appearances it is time to bring back a culture of justification justify a podcast on law and politics in india from the vidhi center for legal policy hosted by orgo sen gupta welcome to another episode of justify as india prepares to go to the polls this season is dedicated to examining issues of law and policy which perhaps will affect the youth vote in the elections a muslim league document a jumla patra and a ghar ghar guarantee these are some of the words that have been used to describe the manifestos of various political parties and you'll all agree that this is one election where manifestos seem to have played a central role at least in the campaign Vidhi has a briefing book this year called The State Shall which has 25 reform ideas for any new government to consider. We are delighted that some of these ideas are already in the manifestos of many major parties. But it is also a reality that manifestos have often remained promises on paper. To correct this somewhat, today's episode will focus on three key areas: health the judiciary and the environment these are areas core to our own work and the future of a healthy india based on the rule of law i'm joined today by alok prasanna kumar and dhwani mehta who are my co-founders at the vidhi center for legal policy and devadito sinha who is the lead of the climate and ecosystems team at vidhi welcome to justify thanks for go thanks for having us on dhwani let's start with you uh one of the key issues that has come up through the election though perhaps unintentionally is the controversy over the withdrawal of covid shield and the controversy over withdrawal of covid shield because of side effects has again led to a question of deficiencies of in regulating health in india and uh, vaccination rates continue to be below average there is heavy import of medical equipment which as we know has also had its share of regulatory concerns so to achieve these promises of better health regulation something that most parties have at least a passing reference to in their manifestos what do you think the upcoming government should focus on Sure. Thanks, Orbo. I mean, that's a real laundry list of things that are wrong with healthcare regulation in the country. Um, and as you can see from the examples you cited yourself, there seems to be a fundamental deficit of trust. People don't. People are suspicious of private hospitals. They are suspicious of uh, foreign manufactured drugs. Uh, all of this is because they are not confident of the government's ability to. regulate these uh private actors um, appropriately and i mean of course the answer to this is better regulation i mean and that's very simple simplistic because we need to spell out what that better regulation means uh but more fundamentally this also requires building capacity within our own public health systems because the government cannot and doesn't actually have a legitimate leg to stand on uh, and regulate the private sector if it's unable to deliver on providing public health in its own government run hospitals and this you know this has been one of the primary um, ways in which the private sector has resisted regulation they, they don't want to be regulated if the same standards are not imposed on government hospitals themselves so, so does this does this essentially come down to how much we are spending on healthcare because there is always this criticism that india of course spends less than 1% of its gdp on health and this number should go up so should it really be the demand of the citizens that the percentage of spending on healthcare as a percentage of the gdp go up to some number absolutely i mean that is that is a fundamental prerequisite and you will see that in a a lot of manifestos as well the people centric manifestos for example the jan swasthya abhiyan which is you know the people's health movement has itself talked about the need to uh, increase uh, gdp spending and this is something we hear every year but just increasing the spending will not change other problems that are caused because of a lack of 
incentive to provide better health care in public uh, you know health care centers incentivize medical professionals to be present in rural outposts and provide the care that is needed to improve the quality of medical medical education uh, not all of this I, I mean yeah you can throw money at the problem but if you don't have the systems in place uh, to to deliver on that to use that money efficiently uh, then that won't be enough so alok maybe i'll take that to you dhwani spoke a little bit about the the public health related deficiencies that exist but on the private side i mean private the private health uh, providers have of course been uh, resisted regulation for a range of different reasons they don't want to be held to different standards uh, than public health providers and apart from the fact that regulation is also costly but there is great uh, reservation about uh, the quality of private healthcare that is provided in India, particularly a large range of healthcare providers that exist, not necessarily the ones at the top of the pyramid. Uh, but when we come to regulating that, there is always a state capacity issue in terms of how we regulate it. So in terms of, again, looking ahead for a manifesto of a political party and an agenda of a new government, how do we look at regulating private healthcare in an environment where the word regulation itself seems like a bad word? So just to start with something that you mentioned, I think the Lancet had a recent article either this month or the previous month, which tracked uh, private health outcomes uh, from those who had availed private health care, and they were significantly worse. Uh, a lot of people anecdotally will say private health care is so good, look at this hospital, look at that hospital. But unfortunately, on a much larger scale, there are very perverse incentives in place in the system, which do not allow for what we theoretically like to believe that the free market will create these outcomes. Those outcomes are not happening. I think that Lancet study, uh, perhaps you can link it in the show notes if possible, that kind of makes it quite clear. And I think the regulation is not an end in itself. I keep telling this in the context of all of our conversations. The regulation towards what end? And I think that this is where Indian regulators don't think, or let me take one step further. Indian lawmakers don't think about why are we regulating this? There is already, of course, a Medical Council of India, which ensures certain standards for hospitals. There are always the registrar of companies. There are a whole range of regulators. There are people who sort of, there are, of course, bodies which look at your medical devices and so on. But what are we regulating towards? And I think this is where the government sort of needs to be clear that we are regulating to ensure that outcomes for patients who access private health care are at a certain standard. And this is where exactly what Dhani sort of points out comes into problem, that private sector will immediately turn, out, turn around and say, what are the standards, I mean, what are the standards of the outcomes in uh, public health care? People who are going to government hospitals. And this is where the government will be stuck. So whatever capacity you have, if you're not clear what you're regulating this for, you risk creating far too many unintended consequences. You risk perhaps defeating the purpose of the regulation and net net everyone loses in the process. I think what perhaps it, this is a large, much, much larger policy uh, discussion, which is what exact role do we expect private healthcare to play? And I get the sense that what is really needed is a public commitment to spend money on public health care and not see private health care as a replacement or some market driven replacement for the government's obligation to spend on public health care. Yeah, I think that uh, that answers it to a great extent. And one area, of course, where there is no doubt that we need greater regulation is in relation to the quality of air that we breathe in our cities. And this is, of course, living in Delhi. This is this has been a constant grouse that everyone has that the quality of air in Delhi is 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 simply such that you can't live here, particularly if you can't live here with young children. So, Deb, I'll take this to you. This doesn't really figure on manifestos of parties as much as it should, given the fact that it is reducing lifespans of people. The Congress did say once that it would declare it to be a public health emergency. Every time during Diwali, there is we hear of GRAP, which is the response program and where various levels of escalation. 
But even now, as we sit, the AQI outside is 201, though it seems like a summer day. So it's actually not a very good day, even today in the middle of summer. So what is the kind of regulation you think political parties should be looking at as far as the question of preventing air pollution, not just in Delhi, but in most other major cities in India? Uh, thank you, Ardho, uh, for uh, <clears throat> inviting me for this podcast. Uh, so, uh, as I'm hearing uh, other speakers also uh, discussing about the GDPs and spending on public health care. Now, you know, uh, we must also understand that uh, how our policies are influenced. It also influenced by our uh, like economic uh, aspirations and what government thinks about uh, these areas. And uh, I just want to make a comment before I respond to you that, you know, <clears throat> our GDP uh, numbers through which we measure our progress doesn't account for any externalities like environmental and social cost to those, those development. This is the reason that whenever there is a pollution, whenever there is some uh, like an extreme weather event, our GDP, the GDP uh, by which our government measures the progress of our country and we always like, you know, a great pride of our GDP numbers this GDP doesn't take into account the externalities like environmental cost, social cost, health cost to that development. Okay. And this is the reason that, you know, even when we talk about the health issues, environmental issues, we always prescribe problems which can help the markets to flourish or the economic progress to continue. For example, whenever there is air pollution, people will buy more air purifiers. They will spend more on the, like, you know, medicines and everything. It will help our GDP numbers. So the primary concern here is that if you see any government, irrespective of BJP, Congress, or whatever, who have in power, they, they always talk about the controlling of uh, pollution, uh, but not preventing at the source. Like, okay, fine, you may declare public emergency, but you have to control the source of the emission. And from, and what is the source? The source, there are two kinds of source. One is the consistent source, which is year round, every time, like, you know, this is like always, it is there. And there are some seasonal sources like firecrackers and like, you know, parali burning when periodically we hear and there's a lot of politics around it. But I give an example of Delhi. You know, in Delhi, in uh, between 2001 to 2021, we had seen the number of vehicles registered per year has gone from 1 million to 3.4 million in one year. It is only for private vehicles. Now imagine the number of vehicles added, uh, taxis and other things. Do you think a city which is limited by space uh, can afford to sustain those kind of vehicles with the emissions? Where the emission will go? We are also covering the entire spaces, open spaces by buildings. We're going vertical now. Okay. <clears throat> so this is one thing. So, you know, uh, uh, if you talk well, about... Why uh, the response not be that, you know, you increase your standards in relation to what can be emitted? Go to Bharat 6. What's the problem with that? Even if Cars are an aspiration. People want to buy cars. You can't stop people from buying cars if they have money. But make sure that the cars come fitted with emission standards. What would no, be that will also not help. That will also not help, sorry. Because BS6 is just a standard. It may be a slightly reduced emission. But see the scale. See, you can say 20% reduction emission. But yearly or 40-50%, there is additional cars coming on the roads. So the concept so is there a that we cap the number of cars on the road. Definitely, definitely. Uh, many cities in the, around the across the world they have done it. They have capped the number of cars. So I think this is this can be one uh, very uh, like you know basic uh, policy solution to limit the number of cars which can be allowed on Delhi roads. It can bring down a significant amount of emission from consistent source, which is year-round vehicular emission. Bonnie, I'll just take that question to you because in an era of populist governments, which are always promising upward mobility for individuals, while capping the number of cars that can be registered is perhaps necessarily and necessary environmentally, it seems like a very hard sell for a government to say that, okay, now you have the money and you want to move from a two-wheeler to a four-wheeler. But no, we are only going to register X number of four-wheelers. So do you see this as a feasible solution or do you have any alternatives as to what political parties could do? I mean, I don't, I agree with Dave. I agree with Dave that this is the technically the right uh, solution. But in terms of uh, it ever finding purchase, it, 
I mean, one, you have you're facing the the resistance of you know powerful economic interest groups, you know, in terms of auto manufacturers or whatever it is. But as you said, it's also the aspirations of people themselves to move, become upwardly mobile. Uh, and currently, this this kind of aspiration is trumping the concern about public health. So again, the fact that an environmental emergency is a public health problem, the communication around that just hasn't succeeded, right? Because if it had, we would see more, more impetus towards making this a demand from, from this would be something that had in, that entered the political consciousness. This would be something that people cared for and made an election issue. So, I mean, you, you know, politicians also do, they have a reasonable pulse on, you know, what, what uh, the mood of the nation is. They know what it is that people are looking for when they make promises and guarantees. This has clearly not figured as a, as an important enough uh, guarantee and how will that happen unless there is better education and communication ab about this issue and that's and right so I, also, I always feel that uh, the city of delhi is actually the city that is most ripe for a green party uh, which exists yeah, in many cities exactly. in the world where air pollution crises is when the aqi hits more than 60 uh, and here we have an aqi regularly above 250 but there is no green party uh, I Absolutely. think that's uh, I mean, I mean that's, that's something that needs to be worked on and yeah. that our frameworks are wrong and so they've been the briefing book one of the things that you talk about which is something that you've been working on is this idea of biodiversity offsetting this idea that whatever development that we are planning uh, it needs to ensure that there is a net biodiversity gain and not loss and that will simply not happen by planting some trees in some far, far uh, God forsaken place really far away, but it needs to be something that is a net biodiversity gain. So could you explain that a little bit, perhaps with an example of what you mean as a policy of biodiversity offsetting? So, yes, thank you, Argo, for asking this. Actually, you know, uh, forest loss is a significant environment challenge world over. And India is like there are some reports which says that India is just second to Brazil in terms of deforestation. But you know, year on year on year, we are seeing that India's forest cover is increasing. Now, how it is possible that one side we are saying forest is reducing and one side we are saying forest cover is increasing as well? The difference is we are losing our natural forest as ecosystem. And slowly we are replacing it with plantations. Why it is happening? Because we have a law which is Forest Conservation Act, now called One Selection Adhinium. So under it, it says that if you want to divert any forest land uh, for any development activity, non-forest use, then you have to take forest clearance from the central government. And the ideal scenario is that whether we should go with this project or not, and in the like you know as a last option, there's no other alternative. We have to cut the forest. Then you have to uh, like you know do compulsory afforestation. So this term is used in the law as well. Like you have to. It simply means that if you are <clears throat> destroying one acre of forest, then you have to plant equal number of trees in some same area or double the area, depending on the circumstances. And this is how we are saying that we are compensating the forest loss. The problem here is that we are only uh, measuring the success in the terms of number of trees. Now we know India has different biogeographic zones. Forest in Andaman, Nicobar or Northeast tropical Indian forest, you cannot compare with thorny forest or central Indian deciduous forest. They are different kind of forest. Now, what happens is that when you promote such policies, you are undermining the habitat because forests are also ecosystem. They are repository of biodiversity, and they are very unique in that particular place. So, the law, although it says you have to compensate the forest, but it came down to only to number of trees and to some extent carbon of uh, like you know carbon sequestration. This whole discussion about the biodiversity restoration is lost. Now, international organizations like IUCN, I mean World Bank, so they suggest that, you know, for any compulsory uh, statutory, uh, like, you know, station, these programs, we should follow uh, biodiversity offsetting. It says that the success of that compulsory afforestation or compulsory restoration project uh, should be measured by the net biodiversity gain. And they said there are three main principles. The first principle, very quickly, I will summarize, is called additionality. That means that wherever you're undertaking this uh, restoration project, 
it should result in extra conservation benefits. Second principle is equivalence. It says that the target or like species should be aimed to preserve same biodiversity. For example, if a species which is found in Nicobar Island, you have to destroy the forest, then you have to ideally find the same kind of ecosystem, same type of species you have to conserve to like restore the thing. Third comes permanence, which says that until or unless this negative impact on this particular uh, area is there, we have to keep continuing like supporting that uh, restoration project. So the two, three uh, major uh, like, you know, principles are there. So we think that, you know, uh, if we can include this biodiversity principle in the current forest laws, at least we can, uh, like, you know, hold the biodiversity laws. Okay, forest cover is increasing, but there should be some ecosystem benefits to the first station as well. I think that's a great idea, and I hope that this is this is taken up, uh, that biodiversity offsetting becomes a principle that we follow in our forest laws. And maybe even if governments don't do it, we've seen that courts are often at the forefront when it comes to incorporation of uh, at least nice sounding environmental principles. Uh, and this would certainly qualify as one of those, which segues nicely into the third topic of our discussion, which is courts, something that we at Vidhi, uh, with our justice access and lowering delays in India, Jaldi mission, have talked about for a very long time. So, Alok, I'll come to you. Since 2019, the Congress has promised an overhaul of the judicial structure by creating a court of appeal and a constitutional court, separating it out. The Attorney General of this government, the former Attorney General K.K. Venugopal, had also made a similar suggestion of creating a court of appeal. <clears throat> so, in your view, given the problem that we are trying to solve is one of judicial delays, we're looking at three crore pending cases in the country that are delayed for more than two years. Do you think that reforming the Supreme Court in this fashion is what a policy priority should be? Or are we barking up the wrong tree and instead we should be looking at the bottom of the hierarchy that is the district courts and the subordinate judiciary? I'll be my contrarian self and say neither. Okay. <laughs> so to me, the problem, and this is, comes from our research over the years and also the research of a former colleague of ours, Sumati, uh, the problem is not at the Supreme Court. I mean, it's there, not saying that uh, there's no problem. It's, the biggest problem is actually at the high court level. And this is one tier of the judicial system, which personally, I feel not enough scrutiny takes place. Because, and the data shows, and this is where I'm coming from, the number of cases per judge, right? Everybody wants to look at the judges per population, which is a completely ridiculous metric. It has no relevance to anything. You have to look at number of cases per judge or judge per cases, however you want to define it. The highest is in the high courts. The high courts are therefore most overburdened, right? We know it's anecdotally, we know that this is true. And now data is slowly starting to show that in the context of criminal appeals, we know that this is true because they have possibly a jurisdiction even wider than the Supreme Court in the context of the kinds of cases that they handle. And more often than not, they just lack the personnel or the resources to address the number of cases that are sitting in their docket currently. So to me, it and the other important function that the High Court does is that it kind of oversees the trial judiciary, which is unfortunately called the subordinate judiciary in our constitution. It should be. Uh, if the high court sets the standard that we are setting the law on all these areas, well, we are clearing the laws, so there is no scope for confusion or this thing, it will fix a lot of problems in the, sub, in the trial judiciary as well. And you may not need to just keep recruiting en masse because it will be hard to train that many judges. If the high court gets its act together, it can actually make a large, or all the high courts in India, if they get their act together, they can possibly make an enormous difference in the problem of long delays in the disposal of cases. And here's the thing, you don't need every single high court to be reformed from ground up. We are really only talking about five to six of some of the largest high courts, which in no order of specific preference, you're talking about the Patna High Court, the Allahabad High Court, the MP High Court, the Gujarat High Court and the Bombay High Court. I think a bulk of the heavily delayed cases are actually constant. And these are some of the largest states. These are some of the largest economies. Unfortunately, we have not put in place the right 
level of resources in this particular tier of the judiciary in these states. So I frankly think the not to say that there's no point in reforming the Supreme Court. Of course there is. But in the order of priority, it should come way, 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 way lower than what it features in most manifestos. So on the supply side, you're saying, let's look at the high courts and let's yeah. look at what we can do there. I think that's a, that's a great suggestion, given the fact that the high courts occupy that space where they are really the yeah. final courts for many classes of litigants. And, and let me just add here, our report of 2015, sorry, sorry, uh, which is uh, where we looked at this exact issue. And this the suggestion of a lot of experts and lawyers and people whom we spoke to was, unless you actually change the way cases are heard and decided in the Supreme Court, Dividing it into divisions and so on is nice to do, but not impactful. Sorry, Dhani, you were saying something. Now, I was going to say that you can apply the same analogy to health. So, concentrate on your public health centers and not on building more aims, which is what a lot of political parties talk about in their manifestos. Everyone wants to build an aims in their state or in their district. Uh, and that's not, tertiary care is not, is not what is, I mean, of course, there is, a lack of access to tertiary care and lots of people don't get the care they need. But what we really need to focus on is building a more robust public health system at the right. level. And I think this is actually a problem that plagues our policy making across the board. You look at it in education, everyone wants IITs in their state. I think there's a there's a particularly perverse reason for that, and which is the fact that setting up an island of this nature is much more easier to do. It has got great optics, so it can be sold very well uh, to the constituency, and it makes people feel that they are special in some way, while not solving the foundational problem at all, which is actually a much more difficult problem to solve. And I see this is a pattern that repeats itself with the number of conferences that we have on alternative dispute resolution, the number of times we talk about setting up new aims, or new IITs and ICERs of, of this nature without actually tackling Lucknow University, without tackling Allahabad High Court or the best medical college that exists in any given city. I think that's that's actually the core of the problem and maybe that's a much larger discussion in terms of the pitfalls of democracy itself and the short-termism that comes with it. But uh, we leave that for a different day. Um, Alok, but we've made another suggestion in the briefing book on the demand side, which is that we've said that we should abolish court fees, that court fees are a big hindrance as far as access to justice is concerned for a large section of litigants. And uh, they should be able to come to court and court should be a public good. And I think this is very different from the kind of rhetoric we've been hearing about the court, which comes from a good place, which is that courts are performing a service. Okay. I mean, the courts are not giving a service in the same way in which someone who's pressing your clothes is giving you a service. Uh, courts are a public good and people should be allowed to access it free of cost. Um, but at the same time, there has been suggestions that there should be a fast track fee that should be levied for people who want to go to our commercial courts. So how do you see this proposal of abolishing court fees, especially given the fact that we already have such an overburdened system and this could potentially have the impact, impact of burdening it further? I would completely agree that court fees should be abolished because court fees are a barrier to entry. All right, it's, it's literally that door which is, again, to think of from the most overused metaphor in the context of uh, courts from Kafka's trial, it's that first set of guards who's telling you, you can't go inside, it's too expensive. Remove that set of guards, but you also have multiple other barriers to access justice. There's a huge gap, let's keep in mind, between accessing courts and accessing justice. So I would say court fees are great to allow people to access courts, but we also have to understand that the public good is limited. A public good is not unlimited. In this case, it is limited by the time of the judges, of the time of the court staff. This is where questions of prioritization will come. This is where something like the commercial courts were proposed. And they were not proposed so much as a, and I was part of that process with the Law Commission of India. They were not proposed so much as a, a alternate fast track justice mechanism in India. 
they were proposed as this is what courts in india could look like if we have to think think of think of them from start from scratch and the idea was to marry a certain set of procedural reforms to a certain set of institutional changes now how well that has happened how well it has succeeded or failed it's a vidhi project coming soon hopefully uh, subject to all the other factors but my sense is we should not see the commercial courts as a fast track alternate we have to see commercial courts as here is what if if it, if it goes well right it could be a disaster we could find out it was terrible but it's an experiment worth conducting because we have not, we have literally nothing to lose at this point of time if commercial courts work well they could form the basis for much larger reform in the civil judiciary itself and this and the key to the commercial courts is the effective management of the court's time you give the judge control of how the case moves you don't leave it to the parties and this is where i think the difference is going to happen it's not like we're creating separate lanes we are creating a proof of concept which yeah i mean the re judicial reforms don't happen overnight we have realized it takes 30 40 years but if a proof of concept has to work for 10 years so be it but if we show that it succeeds it can form the blueprint for wider judicial reform and that wider judicial reform according to me the single most pressing issue is how do we make most effective use of the judge's time in that particular courtroom and i think everybody assumes that if you put a monetary figure to it which is the old british approach of impose costs do this do that that is a way of enforcement that is not per se the way in which you manage the time that is just a way of saying that if you don't follow what i say these will be the consequences so i think yes court fees should go they will make access to courts easier but to make access to justice real we will need to learn from the commercial court experiment and expand it to the wider civil judiciary to completely reimagine how civil procedure and civil court should function in this country i think that's a great point at which to leave it i think there's a suggestion there which is something that uh, we've all somewhere considered at vidhi that judicial reforms should not be the problem that courts alone face but judicial reforms should be the business of government because at the end of the day it is about citizens who have to access justice and governments are elected accountable institutions in a way in which courts are not and not meant to be so judicial reforms must be front and center of every government's manifesto if they are interested in creating an india that is based on the rule of law and equal justice to all and i think that's been a great discussion on a range of subjects spanning from health climate judiciary and for many more subjects do look at our briefing book it's called the state shall it is available on vidhi's website which will be linked in the show notes so do have a look at it and please do give us your feedback thanks very much alok devaditto dhwani it's been lovely talking to you today a real pleasure and as we close it's time for free and fair our special audience poll where you as the listener get to exercise your franchise so do it honestly and candidly our question today do you read manifestos before voting in elections vote yes or no to cast your vote please visit my twitter account at the rate orgo underscore justify or with his linkedin page you have 48 hours adjourn if you enjoyed listening to this podcast follow us on twitter at vidhi underscore india for regular updates We are on SoundCloud and Spotify as Vidhi Center for Legal Policies podcast. You can also listen to us on Google Podcasts or iTunes. Email us at justify at vidhi legal policy dot in to share your comments and feedback on this episode.